Good evening and welcome. My name is Abel Valenzuela and I am Professor of Chicano Studies and Urban Planning and Chairman of UCLA's Cesar Chavez Department for Chicana and Chicano Studies. <clears throat> It is my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. We will screen the film, Cesar Chavez, and then we get to hold a panel discussion on Mexican cinema, on the UFW, on Mexican labor, and the Chicano, Chicana movement. Then we'll have a brief Q&A with the audience. Before I thank a few key folks, I want to say a few things, a few things about Chicano studies at UCLA. Our department is the only named department in the entire University of California system with the exception of one department at Berkeley. Our department is named after the man who will of course be featured in today's film. Our program, which became a department in 2005, offers about 80 courses enrolling more than 3,000 students per year. We have two full um, 12, excuse me, 12 full-time faculty with more coming, an additional five jointly appointed faculty, and another 12 affiliated faculty for a total of almost 30. Every year we graduate about 120 majors and about 50 minors. We recently opened our PhD program and interest in the program is robust. All of this is to say that Chicano and Latino studies at UCLA is visible, it's making an impact, and we are making ourselves presente. <laughs> so tonight's program has, has been brought to you by the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. Before we begin, I would like to say a few words on behalf of Cho Noriega, Professor of Cinema and Media Studies and the Center's Director who could not be here tonight. He sends his apologies. First, I would like to thank Melnitz Movies for partnering with the um, Chicano Studies Research Center to present tonight's film. Extra special thanks go to Laura Swanbeck and Stephen Foley for their hard work and attention to logistics and um, the technology details. Second, I really want to thank my very good friend, um, Professor Hector Calderon, who I first met about 20 years ago when I first stepped foot on this campus. He is professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. I want to thank him for conceiving of this event and going above and beyond the clouds to bring it into being. And I mean, this, I mean this quite literally, as I believe his first discussion with Mr. Luna took place on a plane to the EFE, to Mexico City. Hector's commitment, along with that of the Chicano Studies Research Center events coordinator, Rebecca Epstein, was extraordinary in this program, and it would not have been produced um, without them and, and her staff. Professor Calderon will moderate the panel following the screening. I also want to, of course, thank the staff, um, many who you saw out there, um, for all of their hard work. And one more time to Rebecca, who really is the glue that put all of this together. <laughs> also, special thanks. <clears throat> also, special thanks to, our, to the generous sponsors of tonight's event. The Chavez Center, my department for Chicano Chicana Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Office for Diversity and Faculty Development. Thanks as well to Chair Randall Johnson in Spanish and Portuguese and Vice Provost Christine Littleton in Diversity and Faculty Development. Finally, we are profoundly grateful to Director Diego Luna and um, Canana and Pablo Cruz, the film's producer, for providing us with the opportunity to host this event at UCLA, an advanced screening of this highly anticipated film. And of course, to Mr. Luna, to Mr. Cruz, and to Arturo Rodriguez, president of the United Farm Workers of America, for being here tonight to present in the post-screening panel discussion. Before we start the screen, I'd like to invite um, director um, Diego Luna and producer Pablo Cruz to say a few words about the film. Hi, uh, I think this is the this is the university I've been the most in. Uh, this is the second time we screen a film here. 
but I I drive a lot through UCLA. I so wanted my son to come to to the UCLA lab school uh, <laughs> because of the first impression I got from this place. Uh, and uh, I have to say, it feels amazing. And I just don't want to get too excited by the idea of having a full theater and people waiting outside for something we've been working for for four years. You know, this is amazing. I just hope the 28th of March, we don't drive through theaters and suddenly see that reality is different. Uh, <clears throat> We're going to be here talking at the end, so I'm not going to say much. But just in case, if you guys have to go, if you have kids and uh, there's a nanny waiting or something, just remember, if you like the film, help us get as many people as we can to the cinemas on the 28th. And not because we want to be rich, because in fact, we'll make other, other people rich. It's not us. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but because we have to send a message uh, to, the, to the industry in this country, and you, you guys that are in Los Angeles, you know how important it is to send the message that our stories need to be out, our stories need to be represented, and with respect and with the depth and complexity that our community has. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. And for those of you that don't like the film, just make sure you talk about it in May, June, <laughs> in your holidays, but not now. It's not the right time. Uh, we're going to be here at the end, and this is an amazing gift to be able to not just talk to you, but listen to you. Uh, we cannot change the film now, but at least we'll know <laughs> uh, what to do in the next one. Thank you very much for being here, and I'm going to pass the microphone to you. My partner here. Hey, Just quickly want to thank, uh, there's people here from Canana, who's our, it's our production company. Uh, we have offices here in Los Angeles. I want to thank the associate producer of this movie, Vanessa Perez, if she's here. Without her, this film would have never happened. To Enrique Latapi, who's a young and very enthusiastic Mexican who helps us. And to Paloma, who's the heart and soul of organizing this screening. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, uh, we worked on this really since November when I saw him. Uh, we have the same airlines. I won't say which airlines. You know? When I saw him in November and then uh, I knew he had just finished the film on Cesar Chavez. And then I, went, I came back and I talked to my friends here and they said, sure, go ahead. You know? And then uh, got in touch with Paloma, who's around here. And uh, uh, I had sent him a letter, and uh, she said, yes, he's interested. No? And then uh, by um, the perfection of coincidence, which is like destiny, I was sick on January 6th, and I couldn't make it. So my flight was January 8th. <laughs> so we're waiting there, and uh, you know, OK, let's get this going. I want to go home, right, to start teaching. And then uh, all of a sudden, he walks in. And I said, damn it, I have to talk to him now because I've been in touch with Paloma, and so now's the time to, to, to get him. Uh, and I go, uh, Diego, as he was going over to Migración, and he looks around, and I say, well, soy Héctor Calderón, el profesor de la UCLA, está en contacto con Paloma, ¿no? Y, y te interesa el evento en la UCLA? Y me dice, sí. Le digo, ¿lo hacemos? Me dice, sí. Entonces lo hacemos, ¿no? Entonces dijo, ok, ¿no? Entonces, a partir de ese momento decidimos, bueno, a hacerlo. Y la persona que me ha ayudado con todo esto es una persona divina. Y her name is uh, Rebecca Epstein. And she has just been uh, amazing uh, with uh, getting all this together. I'm saying November to, to this moment. No. When I first wrote an email to John and Abel and to her, and then she responded just to me. She goes, do you want to kill me? And, so, and I said, no, I don't want to kill you, uh, but do you want to do it again? We had just finished the 50th anniversary of John Ritchie's City of Night in October. And it was, again, uh, uh, one of those things that takes a lot of planning. 
And uh, so she said, okay, let's do it. So next year, huh, we're going to have another, another event. But really, I can't say enough about, about uh, Rebecca uh, helping out uh, with this. So please, yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, and all the folks who have contributed have been mentioned before, you know, Abel, Chon, Randall, uh, the dean, et cetera, all those people. And for me, of course, uh, thank you so much. And really to, to thank uh, uh, El Charo Lastra here. Que no le va la América porque... No. Oh, para. Que no le va la América, who's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, really nice. So uh, he's, he, he's okay. <laughs> he's okay. Now you're beginning to know me. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I'm going to dismiss with... Uh, introductions, uh, because you know Pablo and, and, and uh, El Charo Lastra, perdón, uh, but uh, we're joined now no, by Arturo no, Rodriguez, who is the, the only uh, other no, president of the United Farm Workers after the passing of Cesar Chávez. No? So, 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 um, so, 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 uh, so thank to uh, Arturo also for saying yes that, that he would be here. He changed his schedule to come to come here. So I'm I'm really pleased that that he could be here. And uh, uh, Diego said yes, I want Arturo here with me. So uh, it it worked out. No, they were able to do that. And of course we want Pablo Cruz also here with yeah. us. Of course the the producer. We wouldn't be here if it were for for Pablo for Pablo Cruz. No. So. Just, uh, uh, I just want to say some general things, and you can answer if you want or not, but things that I have thought about for quite some time about Cesar Chavez, you know, about the film, about the, these filmmakers and who they are and what they do at this moment in time. That is different what has been done before in Mexican cinema and Mexican film. And then also for uh, Arturo, I had said uh, through his staff that I wanted an update uh, on the United Farm Workers, because the film ends with triumph, no? uh, the signing of that, of that contract. But of course, the, uh, the United Farm Workers uh, is a civil rights era no, entity who has survived, who has continued after that civil rights era. If we think of Martin Luther King and his movement, well, that didn't survive the 60s. But, uh, Cesar Chavez, or the memory of Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, has uh, continued through this time. Now we're in, 20, in 2014. So I think it's important to point that out. That's, it's one of the enduring uh, labor movements in the history of the United States that is still with us uh, today. You know? And then for uh, the filmmaking here that, uh, that you just saw, uh, but it's, it's, it's important for me to point out uh, that this is... Uh, a year, 2013, 2014, when we saw a series of films that had to do with civil rights or African-American culture. Uh, one of the latest was uh, 12 Years a Slave. And, and uh, there haven't been anyone else that I know of who's gone back to that civil rights era to do something about Mexican-Americans. So it seems to me that's important to point out that this film goes back uh, to that time and to show us uh, uh, an important figure, you no, know, who gave us in some way uh, an important part of uh, Mexican American uh, history, and it's uh, interesting to me that you know it's a, f by a filmmaker and a producer who are from the center of Mexican identity, El DF, and I live in El DF. That's my world now too. That uh, you know they have this film about that, uh, and, and, and uh, they chose a moment in time of Mexican-American history that was a defining moment for us in Mexican-American history. Uh, and it's interesting uh, that these two identities, you know, that center of identity in Mexico City and the Mexican-American identity come together within, within this film. And I say this because this is a radical departure from the history of Mexican cinema, that we have a Mexican uh, director, Mexican producer, who's going to look at this moment in Mexican American, in Mexican American history. So, uh, you know, some of the things that we could ask him is uh, uh, why and 
the vision and what did you want to do with the film? Uh, what do you think is going to be the effect? It's a film, as I told him in our conversation, that goes back and forth across the border. No? It was shot in Sonora, no? and then it's going to be released here in the United States. It's also going to be released uh, in Mexico. So it's a film that's going to travel that, that way, those two, those two roads. And we could ask him how he feels. Uh, how is the film going to play on the other side of the border for uh, reasons of, do people know Cesar Chavez? No? Do they know him in Mexico or in Latin America or in Spain? You know, how is this film going to, in some way, give the image of Cesar Chavez that that we know? And then here, here uh, too, it seems important to me to to, to point out you know, that uh, uh, what you saw on the screen uh, has a history. It just didn't begin in 1962, and that that history begins in the first decades of the 20th century that those people who are farm workers are the people who left Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. So there's a connection between Mexico in the 20th century and the farm workers movement. No, and, and I think that's important to me to point out. If Diego and, and, uh, and Pablo have thought about uh, those uh, connections you know, between uh, who we were through our parents and our grandparents and then who we are, who we are today. And for Arturo, I fly back and forth and I have two homes, no? Mexico City, Mexico is my place and so is LA. These are the two important Mexican centers in the world. No, no there's no doubt about that. And then uh, when I think about what is happening in Mexico and the campesinos in Mexico and what is going on there, Michoacán, Oaxaca, Puebla, and the exodus again as in the first decades of the 20th century, and this is for, for, our, for Arturo, is uh, there are 23 different indigenous languages spoken in the fields of California. Uh, the majority are Triqui, no, uh, Zapoteco, no, people who have come from, from Mexico. And uh, it's, it, it's kind of repeating the, the map of Mexico within the United States, but in a sense, a, a bad map, in a sense that these are the poorest of the poor. These are the ones who uh, inhabit a, a caste system, a caste that goes back you know, time, centuries before. And so uh, I know of a, a community, for example, in Coachella, it's a Purepecha community from Michoacan, and you think of everything that is happening in Michoacan right now, of people who have had to leave their places to come here to, to the United States, and I wonder, for Arturo, know the role of the United Farm Workers in relation to these populations who are binational. No, they're not just here in the United States, but their home base is in Mexico. Florida, Texas, California, and Mexico are the home base for most of our farm workers, which tells you a little bit about our time right now and the back and forth. No, some of us go back and forth in airplanes. Some of us go back and forth in, in other ways. So these are some of the things that I, uh, I thought <laughs> that I thought for my friends to, if they wanted to talk. Maybe Arturo about the, about the indigenous farm workers uh, in California. Thank you. OK, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Hector, for the opportunity and putting all this together. Obviously, Diego and Pablo, they've done a Tremendous job, as all of you saw tonight, what they, have, what they did in an hour and a half and 90 minutes, what they accomplished and, and brought to this big screen in terms of the history and the work and the sacrifices and all that that took place, not only by Cesar, but as you saw, by so many other people that were a part of that movement at that particular time and continue to be a part of this movement. And, you know, the... Throughout our history, we've had different waves of farm workers, different waves of people that have come to work in the fields, dating back into the 1930s and, you know, the Filipino farm workers and Chinese farm workers, and, and then it continued on with the Bracero program in the 1940s when, first, when the Second World War began and folks were imported here into this country to work in the fields. And on paper, it sounded great, the Bracero program, in reality, it was a human tragedy that took place with literally hundreds of thousands of farm workers that were brought in here to the United States in that particular time. And today, it's now an indigenous community that largely migrates here. 
We still have large pockets and large waves of farm workers that have existed here for a long time from Michoacan, Guanajuato, and Guerrero, some of those states. But certainly the most recent wave of farm workers has been the indigenous communities. And we're fortunate here at UCLA to have one of the real experts, Dr. Gaspar Rivera, that's here, a professor here at the university, but that really has taught our organization a lot in regards to the whole indigenous community. And certainly the, the cultures and the differences that might exist from other groups of people that have migrated here in the past. And so that's a very critical part of our work today, is to reach out to the larger farm worker community, particularly the indigenous community, and to work with them very closely in regards to, to ensuring that they understand what exists in this country in terms of protections and rights and opportunities that they may not have had when they were living there in Oaxaca. Um, we've made a real effort to work with Gaspar over the years with the organization that he works very closely with, Frente Indigenous. Um, that particular organization uh, that has been extremely important in the lives of Oaxacan farm workers here that exist here and work here in this country. You know, there's tragedy after tragedy that's taken place with that community of farm workers. A big pool of them live up, and you might have read re most recently, one of the biggest ones that's most recently occurred is in King City, which is at the southern end of the Salinas Valley, there and where the entire police department was there getting bribes and exploiting people and taking their cars from them and vehicles and doing all types of things, arresting them and then selling their cars as a result that they had a big uh, scheme going on there in that particular city and it impacted heavily on the Oaxacan community there. And you hear that time and time again so that it's very important to continue the focus in terms of working certainly with all the communities of workers that come here but in particular the Oaxacan community is certainly one that has been tremendously exploited and deserves uh, a lot of focus and energy, not only from our organization, but from all aspects of society. So, the, the, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, um, the first one was, uh, why this film, no, basically? Sure. Uh -huh. the, kind of. The vision. <laughs> the what, vision. What do you want? And why and or, you know. why? Uh, wow, it's a tough one. Uh, personally, there is a very easy reason, and everything I do in my work is related to my kids. It's for them. Uh, and uh, before that, it was for my father and my mother, and that's why the film, besides being about all the the, the beautiful and amazing work uh, of farm workers and everyone in this movement, uh, led by Cesar Chavez, uh, it's a film about a father and a son, and uh, about that thing that is that I just could get when I became a father, which was understanding why my father wasn't around and why. I had to leave knowing or feeling a distance between the thing I wanted the most next to me that couldn't be there. Uh, and when I had a son, I realized why and the big sacrifice that means for 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 him. And uh, and when I when I decided to to uh, I was forced to direct this film by my partner here. <laughs> Uh, I was very scared, I have to say, after the little film I did before, this sounded like crazy. Uh, but he knows which buttons to push, and, and, and he did. And I remember sitting in front of uh, Helen Chavez, who's uh, truly a hero, uh, uh, a person that was very important for this movement to exist. And I asked her, what do you remember was the, the real struggle behind this movement? What was the big thing? And she told me a, a little story about Fernando. And uh, she started to get very emotional. 
And uh, she said, yeah, he left and he didn't come back. And I remember that in that moment I connected. I said, that's what the film is about. And uh, because I, I don't know if I would be able to do what everyone in this movement did, you know, which is leaving your family behind in order to bring change for them. Uh, I don't know if I'm capable of that, and that's why I believe we're telling the story of, of heroes, not just one. The film is called Cesar Chavez, but it's everyone around him. And uh, yeah, Cesar had eight, right? Dolores had 11, and uh, so yeah, think about those holes. I just have two, and I have two big holes. Imagine 11, damn. Anyway, <laughs> I decided to do a film about that, uh, and uh, and then I was uh, we we were talking about well we've done a lot in Mexico we have a big company we have more than fifteen films we have a film festival we're we're doing great but what's next and we thought about uh, working in something that can erase that border that stupid wall that keeps growing between this country and Latin America. And uh, we thought about engaging with the audience in both sides of the border. And we believe this film has that power, that power to, 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 to belong to both sides of the border and to the experience of Latinos in this country and to the experience of Latin Americans. Uh, we think this film is universal enough to travel. And, um, and I remember with Pablo being in California, I guess I found myself many times driving through an avenue called Cesar Chavez, uh, looking at murals, but not actually knowing what was behind that. And, uh, and it's, it's ridiculous that there's no film about Cesar Chavez. It's ridiculous that we are the first ones. Uh, uh, and it's kind of sad that we have allowed that border uh, to fracture us as communities. We don't share our stories. If you go to Mexico, you ask about Cesar Chavez and they'll always do, oh, that's a great boxer. <laughs> and, uh, and that needs to change, you know? As Cesar said many times, our strength is in our numbers. And if we think about those in the south and the north of the border that speak the same language, that share many things, uh, we're a fucking lot. And, uh, <laughs> and there's a, a lot of strength there that we're not using. So hopefully this film helps in that that needs to happen for change to come. You know? So that's why. I guess I ran out of answers, but... Um, <laughs> first of all, to thank UCLA and to thank you for inviting us to this extraordinary event. It's important for the process of making a film to show it to an audience. That's the moment when we release the children that we created to you. Now it belongs to you and, you know, it's realizing that after four years of struggles and craziness, which have nothing to do in any way mirror to what these guys went through, but in our little environment and our little universe, it was crazy to make this film. But today is yours, it's for you to take it, go home, make sure that whoever felt that connection that Diego was talking about, not only because of the family story, which we believe 100% is you know, the backbone of the story, but also because of the community that you represent somehow from being a teacher in the Chicano Study Center to being part of a community that is 70% Mexican, American, Latinos from Guatemala, from Salvador, Nicaragua. You know, it's growing. And uh, I guess the question that you asked was, why would these pinche Mexicans from middle class backgrounds make I tell you that it was what Diego was saying. There's a connection that we managed to mm, let go, and, and you know, I guess it's the border, as you call it, and I love that metaphor, but we can never forget we are part of a bigger thing. And it's not to create a nation, nationalist thing, feeling, but it's inevitable to feel it. And it's not to fight against the other big chunk of, of the country that this is, but we've been neglected of an image, we've been neglected of a place, we've been neglected of a pride that for some reason we always allowed to let go. 
And if the fellow white people here, African-American, Chinese, feel the same, it's time to embrace it. And it's inevitable that in, very, in the very near future, the last names Lopez, Rodriguez, Martinez will be ruling this country. And it's, very, it's a good time to embrace it. So the easy answer to that big question is, we came to make this film with the most humble feeling and respect to a story that is yours and people who struggle to go through farms and see their parents break their backs and working 20 jobs at hotels and cleaning toilets and taking care of children and destroying themselves for a dream that I don't know longer what it means. But it is part of what this nation is all about and we cannot let it go. And in our humble opinion, we came here to render honor to that. And I hope you enjoyed it. Well, we have two microphones on each aisle. So if you raise your hand and uh, the director will pick out. Um, so everybody can hear your question. So first a comment, and also I worked you know, for the boycott back in the day. So um, it's a beautiful film, and it's going to become a classic organizing tool at a time when, with globalization, we need organ organizing more than ever. So you've done that. Um, I'm curious, because of your age, how you discovered Cesar Chavez and what it was like to learn about him, you know, and then what the family thinks of the film. All right. You, you mean his age or my age? Because there's like a <laughs> no, 10 but, year but, but difference. No, but neither of you. I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't want to make you feel bad. But, uh, <laughs> oh, be still my heart. But, uh, oh, no. He, he, no, I'm kidding. I just wanted to. I, 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 I just needed a few seconds to think about <laughs> what to answer. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, yeah, I, I, I do agree. This has to be used. Uh, the amazing thing, and uh, it's it's uh, to show how this very vulnerable and broken community, full of fear, found a way to talk to consumers. Uh, because I hope this film. I mean, I love the idea that it talks to you, and you feel proud about it, and everyone in this movement feels celebrated. But this film is more for consumers. Uh, I would love people to get out of the cinema thinking, what needs to happen for my food to get in front of me? You know, what's behind this carrot I'm about to eat? And if one day people live knowing that re responsibility uh, that it means to be a consumer, the world would automatically be a better place. So uh, I hope this is used as a, as a tool for change, definitely. Uh, about Cesar, what? Was that wrong? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, How can you? Uh, <laughs> um, what, what did I... Well, obviously, Pablo knew everything about Cesar Chavez because of his age. In, in my case... <laughs> In my case, I, I, I didn't know much. I, I remember, I because I was 14 years old, 15 years old when he died, and uh, I, I do remember images in Mexico. You know, in Mexico, the, the newspaper, the, the, the part that talks about the world, it's next to that that announces cars, and it's just one or two pages. We, we don't seem to care too much about what's happening out of our country, um, uh, or at least those who edit mm, newspapers. But I do remember the image of Cesar's uh, wooden box uh, walking with thousands of thousands of, of farm workers. Uh, uh, and I remember that image because suddenly that was sold in Mexico as a Mexican story. and. Uh, and I remember I was shocked this man was sending a message even when he was dead, you know, about equality, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a box that wasn't even painted, done by, later I, I knew about, the, done by his brother. Um, sí, ¿no? Yeah, Richard. Richard, sí, exactly. No, no, nada más quiero saber si, si, <laughs> si ya me están corrigiendo aquí, ya acabamos la película, es, ya no la puedo editar, güey. But... Uh, I have to say, I, I, I started to be confronted with the story and the, the necessity of a film about Cesar Chavez when I did a documentary about the boxer 
that was like seven years ago, and we came to promote it here because uh, someone had that bad idea. Yeah, <laughs> someone had that bad idea. That someone thought people would care about it, um, so we came. And every time I sat down with someone and talked about the film about Julio Cesar Chavez, everyone went like, oh, finally, that's great. And I was like, finally, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, the guy is still alive and fighting, in fact. So what do you mean, finally? And I realized there was another Cesar Chavez, too. And uh, I was 20-something and... Uh, 17. <laughs> no. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I started to understand that. I started to understand oh, that there was an, um, an amazing story that no one told. And then by asking myself, well, why, why people don't talk about this? Why there's no film? Why There is a film in this country about every heroic story, even stories that are not heroic. They make films and make them heroic. <laughs> uh, but not, not this community. L like Elysium. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> even in the future, see. but. Uh, and I, I, I have a theory that it's, it's because it confronts you with a very uncomfortable reality. It confronts you with, with, with something we're all part of. We're allowing more than 11 million people to work in this country, to feed or fed a country, to construct a country, to, to work so this country can be what it is. And they don't have the same rights of those who are consuming those products. They don't have the same rights of, 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 of those who are actually enjoying the amazing uh, thing of having such a hard-working community there. And that makes no sense. And I believe there is a little bit of that, you know, because by looking at a story that happens on the 60s, by looking at a story that probably has nothing to do with your context because it happened so long ago, whatever, it confronts you with where you are at the moment, you know. And, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, what made me want to do the film because I, I believe there is no way there could be even a debate about an immigration reform. It's absurd, you know, it's, I mean, how can a, a film about slavery be celebrated in the Oscars and, uh, and, and have this new form of slavery happening, you know? Uh, so. <laughs> and responding the about family. the family. The family loves the film, of course. Um, <laughs> That's why we have a bodyguard behind her, but... No, I mean, we, the process of making this film was always with the family. The family is actually the gatekeeper of the whole story, and, and you know, it was, it was a tough relationship at first to learn our traits. The one of organizing and respecting a figure that if you let go once, it will go away. First film ever made about this man the asset of the entire organization. And these crazy Mexican filmmakers who only cared about storytelling. So somewhere in the middle we found a, a path to continue and, and one day Paul Chavez, who's not here but in, in spirit is here, uh, told us, okay guys, go ahead. You know, we've gone through, you know, there was a time when the script had more pages as revisions from the family than the script itself. And we said, guys, you have to thrust us. You know, we're making a film and this has to be about the empathy and it's about characters. And there's a thing there somewhere called the science of filmmaking that <coughs> exists. And um, they allow us to have that freedom. And, and, you know, when they saw the film, you know, we all hugged each other and cried for a long time. So, yes, and Dolores is very much part of the whole thing. And, you know, she was very tough at the beginning. We said, oh, I never would say that. And, <laughs> you know, eventually we all came to terms. And, you know, today I think it's, it's, it's together, the together thing that it's created the strength of the story and, and to promote the film. It's very important that we're all on the same page. Oh, uh, you have anything to add? Mr. Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> no, as Pablo and Diego, as you've seen, I mean, they just... Did a fabulous job. As I mentioned, it took four years to kind of bring it all together, reviewing scripts and reviewing parts and everything else. But they just, they did a tremendous job in terms of, you know, for us that are involved in organizing, I think you saw all the different techniques and strategies that are utilized there and, and made sure that what took place back then 
was brought out in the film, the nonviolence and the whole talk about the boycott. First time that was ever done within the labor movement. And workers go to cities, farm workers that had never been out of California, had never been out of their own farm worker communities, not knowing English, going to Chicago and to New York City and to Cleveland, Ohio and to Miami and all throughout the nation and going into Canada and talking about what it was the life of a farm worker. As you said, you were a boycotter at one time, and there's other boycotters here in the room tonight. And so those were things that happened as a result of the genius and the innovation and creativity of the movement at that particular time, of our leadership, of the workers coming up with ideas in terms of how they could go tell the story. And Diego and Pablo just did a tremendous job at trying to capture all those things, the, the Virgen de Guadalupe and the religion, how much it played a part, the marches, and were simple things, but yet that's what really made, created the success that we've had throughout the years and kind of showed what the difference was from all the other attempts that had been made. Because this wasn't the first attempt to organize farm workers. As many of you know, there had been many, many attempts to do that that weren't successful for whatever different reason. But here, and I think one of the most important lessons that we learned out of here is that Cesar Chavez always talked about, and the leadership always talked about, the importance of common people doing uncommon things. And that's what it tries to demonstrate the film, and, and certainly you all did a tremendous job in capturing that. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, the film was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Um, I saw Abel a long time ago, and I really? loved it. Absolutely. You yeah. were the one. Thank I you. was the one. I saw it at, uh, I think, Morelia at a film festival. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but uh, I work in acquisitions in Latin American films. So, you know, my question is actually very much about where you see, I know you guys work with a lot of young filmmakers, young, you know, La uh, Latin American, Latinos, um, and I know you work with uh, just kind of trying to bring them up so that they have the support. I think the crossover has been so difficult. Uh, it's the holy grail right now. Everyone wants to know, Pantaleon wants to know, how do we get this out to everybody to uh, not make it such a niche film? Um, where do you see those stories coming? Where do you see the future of the young uh, Latin American directors and the stories that they're looking to tell? I, I feel like this might be an introduction to them um, of Cesar Chavez. And I wonder what the, news, what the stories are with so much that we deal with, immigration reform, uh, just inequality in, 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 you know, in ec economically, all of those things. Okay. <laughs> uh, define the future of Latin American cinema. No, you need, it, you need my help. <laughs> Maybe experience can help. <laughs> exactly. This old man had the vision in oh, our company. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say uh, I would say it's about us. Don't leave. It's gonna get fun. Well, or. If you leave, I'm sure it's to call many that are about to fall asleep and you're going to tell them how an amazing journey you had in these two hours looking at this film. I, I, I understand, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a Latin American question. <laughs> uh, you see, that's a problem, you know. When we, when we talk about ourselves as Latin Americans, what is that? Like, if that had a meaning, I mean, I can sit in front, you know, of a guy from Guatemala and a guy from Chile, and we realize we're so different. Uh, so, what I'm going to say is that you just ha stories have a context. At the end, stories and characters have a nationality. Film doesn't, you know? And uh, a film is richer, as diverse as the team making the film uh, as diverse as it uh, can be, it, that that makes a richer result, you know. Uh, but then, yeah, the story has a context, and you have to be specific and accurate and 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 go for it. And I, that's that that's what makes film universal. When you're not thinking about pleasing people, but when you're thinking about pleasing one point of view, and everyone following that, and that's the cinema. When we decided to open a company together, we said, and this is two actors and a producer. 
very dumb because we said the producer let's or the actors the, the three of them uh, <laughs> we said let's make a company that is going to be about respecting the point of view of directors we didn't know the issue we were about <laughs> to get in uh, it's this is all about making sure they can make the film they want because once you you're capable of pleasing one point of view. We're not here alone. Someone will care out there. You know, but it's when you sit down and think, oh, I'm going to do a film that matters to everyone. So let's have a, a nation, a, a Latino that dies in the second act. Uh, or, he could, or, or he could be fat and funny, whatever. That's contraband. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and then you start to do these films that are about a market. And, and that barely works. And if it works in the box office, it doesn't stay in your head forever, you know? It doesn't change your life or anything. And that's what we want to do. So I think also as audiences, we have to stop thinking about ourselves of, as part of a niche. We're not a niche. We're, I mean, I don't know if you know the story behind a film called Instructions Not Included, that it was a Mexican film, 80% in Spanish. Uh, a very famous comedian in Mexico did it, and, uh, and he made $40 million in the States, coming from nowhere, like the UFW. You know, the growers were having champagne <laughs> when they got hit. You know, they were, no one was expecting success to come out from this movie, and it happened. And this is people that probably went for, to the cinema for the first time in their lives, you know? Uh, they're there. It's just us that we haven't reached them, you know? It's us that we haven't fit them. I didn't understand the champagne and the workers part. Well, that the growers never thought this could happen. The okay. growers never thought this community could get yeah. together and organize. I haven't seen you drinking champagne or two. That's no, weird. I was talking about the growers, man. <laughs> ah, the growers. Um, but it's uh, it's an important point. It's it's it's, and I'm sorry to just use the f microphone, but it's here. But um, it's about empowering the cinema of Latin America in a way that you know we somehow we, I'm here. We're here talking to you and. It's our responsibility to be able to continue and pull the string and be able to pull what it's there. And, and it's always been based on the, on the director and the author and the person who writes or thinks about the story. And, and, and you know, even though we made this film, which took you know a lot of attention from our time, but we keep working on the people that are coming. You know, we, here sitting with us is Yolanda. She's a graduate from this beautiful school and. You know, we're you know her story is incredible, and you know you you would think that why these crazy monkeys are thinking and talking to her, but it, this is what we are, and this is what we're all about. I don't know, you know, I realize that after making this film, I'm much better doing Yolanda's movies than trying to fight these crazy studios. You know, so that's what we do. We ha we have to leave. No. What? No, it's just ten. We were... Hector, Pardon? before we leave, can I make one sure. comment? Sure. Okay. You know, Diego, Pablo, all the cast, they invested a lot in this movie in the sense that they were willing to do it against a lot of opposition. And a lot of opposition in this community here that we live in, Hollywood and everyone else, they didn't want to fund it. As Diego said, he was surprised. But it is no surprise when we look at the types of films that come out about Latinos. And so, folks, we all have a mission. We're all organizers here tonight. That's why you were invited, because we know you're organizers. And we need to make sure that when opening weekend comes out, 28th, 29th, and 30th, that we have literally hundreds of thousands of people that we fill up. They're going to be opening in 100, 100 major markets in the country, 600 theaters. So they're putting it all out. <clears throat> and we want to make sure that everybody hears loud and clear that we want more of these types of films, that we want to talk about our heroes, about our community, and share with everyone what we do and talk about the life of the folks, the men and the women, and too often still today, children that harvest our fruits and vegetables. And make sure under, everybody understands that it just didn't get there magically when they walk into the fruit stand or they go into the supermarkets, that it came because of lots of sacrifice and sweat and tears. 
So we leave here tonight with the mission of one, getting not just yourself to the movies, but bringing along at least 10 others. Have a party, get drunk, whatever, before you go. <laughs> but go and enjoy the film with lots of your friends. Yo, march over there. We're not driving, you're marching. <laughs> so have a good time and enjoy it. And then there's a whole, there's a whole effort to also get a petition for a day of service around Cesar Chavez. So we don't want to celebrate a holiday. We want to go and serve the community. That's what Cesar was about. That's what this movement is about still today in the work that we do. And lastly, folks, we got to get behind immigration reform. There's no bigger issue that impacts all of us. And so we ask each and every one of you that's please, if you have not signed that little card, that Teresa at the table passed out to folks, please buy and sign it. If you signed it, turn it in there and leave it there so we can keep in touch with you. We've got to ensure that immigrant workers, wherever they work, are protected, given the same rights and opportunities, and certainly we stop the deportations. So, si se puede. Thank you. Yeah.